Lost in Amber by Esther Rabbit Chapter 9 Newton's Second Law of Motion The more force, the more acceleration. Alex patted her shoulder and spoke. All right, Zoe, that's enough for now. Time for Mia to take the stance. This all felt a bit too familiar for Mia, and too unfamiliar for Zoe. Captivity taught her that reward came with obedience, and so did progress when it came to alien enhancements. She'd been strapped to chairs and tables, wired, monitored, and injected more times than she could count in what she calculated as seven months since her abduction. What Alex didn't know was exactly how thick Mia's skin had gotten in all this time and how far she was willing to go for Rufus. She entered the room and exchanged seats with Zoe as Alex made his way into the small monitoring room, followed by a heap of bouncing copper curls. Mia, I'm going to read your algorithms before I start, if that's okay with you. He sank further in his chair under Zoe's curious stare. Mia nodded, taking a seat on the recliner, only to hear his voice again, two minutes later. Can you tell me how you developed your portaling skills? You want the short version or the long one? Alex's forehead creased in response. I don't know how to answer that question. Go ahead. Take your pick. Um... Well, what I initially knew from what they told me was that they rescued me from having a seizure in the middle of the street and cured me with an experimental treatment, which required constant monitoring and no external contact, no phones or tablets, presumably because I was to stay away from any form of radiation, ionizing or non-ionizing, as a result of, she air-quoted, the very sensitive treatment I was under. Of course, what they didn't know was that I was soon to graduate computer engineering and what they had going on in that lab surpassed any radiation a smartphone could possibly emit. So I confronted Beck. He eventually confessed to the lie, saying they needed to buy time for my sequencing to run smoothly and my gifts to set in. When I began training, I still had no clue what they wanted from me although I had seen what Etienne could do. Alex rubbed his chin, intrigued. What did Etienne show you? He lifted objects with his mind. He could portal anywhere. He told me he'd given me the portaling gift because it seemed fit for a rebel. For the first week, I think I spent around four hours a day submerged vertically in the molecular pool. My head was out and connected to all sorts of wires. I suppose they were monitoring me just like you are doing with this band. Zoe cringed at the sound of her words and bit her lip as Mia continued. They ran all sorts of tests on me to see what triggered my enhancement, I guess. They electrocuted me, instilled all sorts of pain while I was conscious and unconscious and nothing worked. We all learned that my mind had to be willing to cooperate. It wouldn't work faster if they tried to torture it out of me. That's when they switched strategy and rewarded me if I learned to channel my demons. I began by feeling my enhancement in my spine and arms like some sort of electric current and learned how to bring it out of my body, which was hard because I could contain it inside but didn't know what to do with it on the outside, and my blood pressure dropped lower every time. Hear that, Zoe. Alex pursed his lips and turned to face her. Beck is fully aware that enhancements are directly connected with your frontal cortex, so using and perfecting them has to be your decision. He can't force it out of you, but rather make you want to develop it further. It's the same for us. You know, no one can force me to use my enhancements. It has to be my choice or they wouldn't work. This only confirms some very important aspects, which are quite obvious. One, Beck was after you the night Jasper found you, Zoe. He knew we were all coming with you on Sunday, which takes us to two. Whatever he's after, he's running out of time and he needs all altered subjects enough to risk being Exposed to Optins Mia stood motionless. 
There was no give and take with Beck, no dynamic engagement if he wasn't sure he'd win. Alex got close to the mic and spoke again. When did you portal for the first time, Mia? After they killed my dad. I had to keep mom safe, so I tried hard and did everything they said. Zoe felt as if someone had punched her guts. She had no clue what Mia had gone through, no idea how far the damage extended. They had ruined her life. She clenched her fists, feeling the cocktail of anxiety and outrage tear at her insides. Alex got close to the mic again. What happened when you opened the first portal? It took a while because I couldn't extend it past the size of a ball, and I too was curious and kept my eyes on it at all times, so I kept concentrating until I felt the expansion with my eyes closed like Etienne had showed me. He portaled me to Italy on my birthday. It was by far the most peculiar thing I'd ever felt, and I too wanted to do it. Weird, right? She pulled her knees to her chest and continued. I pressed my hand to the floor and thought of Italy. He was by my side when it happened and held my other hand, kept saying not to lose myself in the fall, to keep visualizing the place where I would land, its coordinates, and... I did it. From the small studio room, Alex took notes of everything. The beauty of cognition... Where have you portaled to since? I counted around six countries, as I already told Jasper. But he had to take me there first until I learned to channel coordinates like a GPS. More or less, I can't simply close my eyes and think of Paris if I'd never been there. If I memorize coordinates, on the other hand, I can land quite accurately now. I'd never been to Zoe's house, but since she had an implanted tracker with direct coordinates, well, I could deliver Sam. Alex went quiet. He, too, had portaling skills, which he'd developed and trained from an early age, so he could relate to the frustration of not achieving goals. It had taken me a month to master her enhancement. It had taken him years with guidance and training. Long, frustrating years. ATN seemed to be bettering enhancements, polishing genome editing somehow while applying them to an unstudied species. No one could deny his skills nor his ambitions, although the former ambassador's motives remained a mystery. What's kept you from portaling back to Beck's lab to save Rufus? He broke the silence. I'm not stupid, Alex. I know you don't trust me yet. I could very well have the Stockholm Syndrome or be double-crossing you for all you know. But no, this is not even about me anymore. I could return the question. Why didn't you send me to get Rufus? Were you afraid I might unleash Beck on you if you gave me the coordinates back to this place? You knew it from the moment we landed here. This place exists in a time loop. It's a singularity. You wouldn't be able to portal back unless I taught you and you had permission from the host. So teach me, she dared. I want to see how far your enhancement can go, but we'll need someone to track your progress because I'll have to join you. Alex tapped his intersat with eager fingers. All right. So next step is seeing how far you can actually go, Mia. I've asked Jasper to come down and monitor us from here, he announced, bolting up and sliding the intersat in the pocket of his dark blue coveralls. I'm hoping you'll find some focus by the time we get back, Zoe. Your heart rate's too elevated for your own good. He turned to see her flustered on the small bench behind his workstation. I find it hard to concentrate in closed spaces. Maybe I could join Lilu and the girls since I'll be no use to Jasper from here. Please say yes, she literally begged with her eyes. On the contrary, he can keep working on you as he monitors Mia. You'll have to trust him. Ambassadors strive at multitasking. Great. Zoe mentally facepalmed herself. 
What was life if you didn't slip out of your shorts to slide on the ice once in a while? Because that's what seeing Jasper would feel like right about now. Arms folded, she propped her back hard against the wall. Her whole frame tensed. Alex turned to her and shook his head. He thought he understood her exasperation. He'd lived it himself as he grew to master in high percentage only three out of the five skills he'd been given. His telekinetic abilities served to knock a pencil off the table, and that was as far as they'd stretch. When you could be so much more, do so much more, not being able to forget was lame enough for Alex to take a step back and not give her a hard time about it. Zoe, we made progress today and we'll keep on making progress as long as you stay focused. Listening to Alex only made Zoe tap her foot faster, although she was almost thankful he thought it was all about her enhancements, or rather the lack of them. Time froze as she heard a knock on the other side of the door. Crap! She jolted upright, struck by the sight of Jasper. Too small a room, too big a tension. He smiled, unaffected by the sight of her, as they brushed shoulders on his way to the station. Clearly, this room isn't big enough for all of us. He grinned and nodded at Mia from behind the glass wall. I checked Mia's progress report on my way here. Jasper turned to face Alex as soon as he slid in his rolling chair. Impressive. Alex nodded and entered the room where Mia jumped from the recliner and brushed her palms together, motivated. Let's do this, Alex. Where to? She eagerly watched as he pulled the intersat out of his pocket and showed her the new coordinates. Jasper and Alexandra nodded at each other. Both Mia and Alex evaporated under a blue light and Zoe watched it all from the bench behind Jasper, catching his eye in the reflection of the window. She shrugged and jerked her head in the opposite direction. You'll get used to the portaling light in time, the ambassador spoke, tracing outlines on the intersat. Yeah, about that. I was wondering if I could perhaps join Li Lu since you'll be here monitoring. Alex said it was okay before he left. He turned in his chair to canvas her features. She was up, arms folded in protest. Was that a slight degree of petulance in your voice? A grin now hung on those unholy lips. How very 15th century of you. Who uses the word petulance anymore? She mocked, only to see him flash an even broader smile in return. It's... 16th century, actually, Jasper poked back. First known reference dates from 1535. To tell you the truth, there are not many words in the dictionary to describe you, but petulant might just have your face in the description. I suppose then you wouldn't mind if I had one for you, would you? Hit me with your best shot. Zonderkite, she added her finest death stare to go with it. Checkmate. Jasper kept his tone light. Now that we got that out of the way, Alex left me clear indications on your progress, and I think we could explore it further if you agree and you think you can focus in my presence. Zoe's eyes widened at his smugness. The nerve. Fine! She spat and left the monitoring room only to return to the white recliner and launch herself at it. Now what? Zoe Mills was not one to exit through the back door nor let her ego get in the way of possible progress. Although she'd rather make steak tartar with her bare hands than share a space with Jasper and for a vegetarian like herself. That was saying something. She heard his voice through the speakers. Now I'll join you because the intersats cannot show you real energy, so I have to do it myself. Roger that, she muttered as she followed his tailored vest, making its way into the larger studio room. The lights then dimmed in both rooms. There's no reason to be afraid, Zoe. 
your heart rate is off the charts. I dimmed the lights so you can actually see energy better. He took a seat on the ottoman next to her, pulling himself closer until their knees almost brushed. Even in this dim light, she could trace the outline of his shoulders, so neatly defined under that white shirt. Cussing at herself between thoughts didn't work either, so she moved to the outline of his jaw. His perfect skin nearly mocked her. Your eyes. She heard herself saying, trying to make sense of the changes she registered. He pulled the ottoman closer, so close that he nestled her knees between his legs and all focus was lost. What color are my eyes, Zoe? he asked, unaware she was now digging her fingers in the recliner. Amber. They've always been amber, but now they're more electric. Thank you. He raised his brows and made a steeple out of his fingers as she followed every movement. It was so easy to get lost in the music of his breaths, but she willed herself to focus on the dance of his fingers instead. There had to be more to her enhancement. Shit, Jasper. What is that? There is like a thunderstorm happening between your fingers. She jolted awake, somehow feeling the impulse to touch the small-scale lightning parade between his fingers. Don't touch it yet. Try to pull the electrical discharge to you, he said softly. Use your hands. I don't know how. Like pulling a rope? Put your palms in front of it and pull with your mind. Imagine your hands could pull without touching and try it. She did. It felt like something opening from inside of her, something she couldn't quite describe, something ethereal unfurling in her chest and traveling to her limbs of its own volition. It was expanding, invading, stretching. She closed her eyes and tried to feel without looking, like Mia had suggested earlier. Jasper's eyes widened. He somehow felt her electric pull and the wave of energy reflecting from her hands. To his eyes, they were still in the dim-lit studio, where apart from the energy shift, nothing had changed. For Zoe, however, a light show unfolded in neon colors, even before her fully closed eyes. By the time she dared a peek, her palms were radiating streaks of lightning in electric shades of gold, pink, and purple. She was afraid to let go, but wanted to take it further, so she nodded at Jasper and stood up, her palms still creating lightning balls. Jasper stood up with her, his palms now facing hers under the visually striking display happening only before her eyes. He saw her, wonderstruck, as she followed the magic happening between them. It was a full-on electric storm the colors encircling them both so alive and raw, reflecting on fabric and skin. Tell me what you see, Zoe. I... I think I pulled the small thunderbolt, and I might have replicated more with my hands, but I'm not sure how. So now I think I can move them all around us without guiding them with my hands, just my mind. Do you see it? Her voice was shaking at the sight of the small wonder. Jasper held his breath at the sight of her, imagining her initial discomfort replaced by what every young Optin felt as they entered the journey of discovering themselves. She held his gaze captive. I can't see it. But it feels like a draft around us. He'd never felt anything like it either. Zoe got a fraction closer. I'd like to see what happens if I touch you. It looked and felt like pure sorcery, evolving in waves of light, engulfing them in warmth and adrenaline, as if time had frozen in the swirl of buzzing lightning. In a swift move, Emma arched her body and launched herself claws first at Lilu's throat with the grace of a house cat. Much to her surprise, Lilu froze her midair and remained unmoved at her ungraceful. Sack of potatoes thrown from moving truck, descent upon the famey floor. 
Emma's heart was racing. Her contorted body collapsed, angry at her fruitless attempt and feeble limbs. How are we ever going to kick your ass if you don't give a little? Sam snapped from the other side of the room as she ran to Emma's side. You're never going to get an opt-in if you launch yourself directly at them. Be smart about it. Why do you think Beck had us all lined up like little students back at his lab? Lilu rested her hands on her hips. Sam noticed how ferocious she was when she spoke, like a Tinkerbell samurai. You won't stand a chance against opt-ins if they know you're coming. The only way to complete a successful attack on somebody with skills superior to yours is to catch them off guard and act fast. She kneeled beside Emma and locked hands to pull her up. Emma regained herself and rested an arm on Sam's shoulder as she spoke. I thought your skills didn't work over at Beck's lab. Our enhancements didn't work. But if we'd created a circle around him, we could have easily rendered him unconscious. Sam's life was at stake, so we didn't, Lilu jerked, disturbed by the vibration of her calanium ban. She turned around to tap twice. This had to be the star alignment they were so eagerly waiting for. Sam and Emma nodded at each other and took advantage of Lilu's distracting call to get down and dirty with the enemy. Sam shoved her foot behind Lilu's knee, making her lose balance. Emma then went for a nutcracker choke, aiming for the head and crushing her larynx with the knuckles of her index finger. Stop it, you maniacs! Zoe thinks she killed Jasper, Lilu's face turned to them in horror. What? Emma shook her head in disbelief as she let go of Lilu's throat, only to hear her coughing hard, trying to regain her breath. Oh my God, I'm so, so sorry, Lilu. Her hand instinctively went to her mouth as she steadied herself. Can you portal us there? Sam asked, still in shock, as she helped Lilu up. Get over here, both of you. Lilu pressed a hand to the floor and landed in the studio room a second later. Jasper was lying face up on the floor, limbs motionless, his fingers and forearms covered in what could only be described as third degree burns. Even the sleeves on his shirt were burned to a crisp. Emma's eyes found Zoe crouched and sobbing in the opposite corner of the dark room. The air was heavy with smoke still rising from the heavily burned gray rug and crispy frame of what used to be a chair of sorts. Lilu jumped to Jasper's side, tapping what was left of his calenium band. Panic fused everyone's thoughts as the girls kneeled to shelter Zoe, who couldn't produce words between sobs and gasps. There was ardency in the irregular panting of her chest, terror clouding every feature as she pulled her knees a little tighter to her chest. Sam searched the room to see no signs of fighting, but patches of burned rug and a shattered calenium screen on the wall Jasper had probably collapsed against. Calenium was supposed to be the strongest thing out there. Sam had heard Alex brag about it twice since they got here. Jesus, how could this happen? She thought, yet never spoke it out loud as she scooched to wrap an arm around Zoe, cradling her head in the warmth of her shoulder. This was bad. They all watched Lilu trying to heal him like Alex had done with Sam, and Jasper with Mia. Whoosh after whoosh to the music of Zoe's choked cries. Lilu didn't stop. She kept at it long enough for everyone to wonder if this had been the end of him. The faintest noise came from his throat as she pressed her hand on his bare chest again until a cough mixed with healing light and a weak nose twitch followed. He'd made it. Everyone saw Lelu's body crumple, exhausted, next to Jasper's. She spoke, glued to the floor, her eyes closed, an arm resting on her stomach, 
What the heck happened, Zoe? Zoe wanted to speak, but air had left her lungs and tears were gathering at her chin in a desperate sob. Panic had paralyzed the words that wouldn't escape her mouth. It's not her fault, Jasper's voice came weak. It is my fault, she spoke between sobs. Jasper was trying to help me channel whatever Beck has done to me, and as soon as I touched him, I, I, I thought I killed him. I'm so sorry, Jasper. He turned his face to the side so he could see her. You look like a hamster when you cry. His voice was barely audible at this point. She can see and harness energy, Lilu. I now have a pretty good idea what Beck's plan entails. Lilu was sprawled on the floor, and for the first time since the girls had met her, she looked drained and quiet. It didn't suit her one bit. Want me to send an alert to the team? She kept her eyes closed, voice still consumed. Don't mock me just yet. Jasper, too, felt spent, but optimistic under the circumstances. He picked at his band, checking Zoe's algorithms. Lilu pushed herself up, still worn to a frazzle, arched her back in a stretch, locking her hands at the back of her head in a strong pull while peeking at Jasper. She's good then. Jasper gave a positive nod. All right then, ladies, I think you should take Zoe to her room for now. I'll take Jasper to his. Zoe had no recollection of how Sam and Emma managed to pull her from the floor, drag her up the stairs, and back to her room. Like in a trance, she opened her eyes to trace the outline of her ceiling, reliving the moment their palms touched, and she sent him flying into the wall behind him, cracking the collenium screen in more places than she ever thought possible. He collapsed like a burned match to the floor as she screamed in horror and swung to his side, afraid to lay a hand on him again. But she did, although this time she didn't hurt him, she just held his face in her hands, begging him to respond. It weakened her core to see him so frail, searching for life with desperate fingers, pressing an ear to his chest, and wetting what was left of his vest with fresh tears overflowing at the insanity that had just happened. For a little over an hour she drifted on and off again, identifying her friends' voices, yet unable to make sense of what they were saying. As if a deafening terror had swamped her under. It felt like ages until she could hear their footsteps on the wooden floor and felt as they sat beside her in bed. Look who's the biggest badass in town. Sam's voice finally made sense, warmth clinging to every word. She sat beside her, stroking her curls and hiding her worry like a pro. Emma wrapped her arms around herself and stared at them from the foot of the bed. This whole thing had been a bad idea. Who were they kidding? They were not soldiers, and this war was definitely not theirs. The threat, though, was real. If Beck didn't get to Zoe first, the aliens might for almost killing their ambassador, a terrifying ordeal. Sam spoke as Zoe resurfaced. I don't know if I've already told you this story about Irene, my ex's sister. When she was 23, she was living with her family who she loved to bits, had been dating her high school sweetheart for five years, and was happily employed by this very successful pharmaceutical company in Spain. Living the dream, basically. Sam curled her legs under and added some drama to her story. Over the course of two weeks, her family had to move to France, where her dad started over on a much better pay. Her high school sweetheart dumped her on her birthday, saying he didn't love her anymore, and she was fired from the very promising company she worked at. Even Emma wondered where Sam was going with all this. Naturally, her dream life had done a full spin. She went from having it all to being home alone, unemployed, and heartbroken. What do you think she did next? Sam's inquisitive eyes caught Emma nervously scratching her elbow. 
If you're gonna say speed dating, I might slap you right here, she replied jokingly. Nope. She went to church. She prayed and begged God for her life back. Emma rolled her eyes in response. You want to find a church around here, Sam? Wait for it. So she steps out of the church and reaches into her purse to grab her wallet and get a cab, but the wallet is nowhere to be found. Sam paused for suspense. She had been robbed in the frigging church, if you believe that. Emma draped a hand over her mouth, shaking her head. No. It was both tragic and hilarious. Zoe found Sam's voice soothing. How is she now? Happily married, awaiting her second child. Point is... Can it get any worse? Yes, but it also gets better, especially after it gets worse. Spoken like a true therapist, Emma watched Zoe pull herself into a sitting position. What had they done to her? What had come out of her downstairs? I could have killed him, Zoe sighed, feeling Sam's hand wiping her tears. Emma finally joined in, taking a seat on the bed. But you didn't. Her hand came on Zoe's with a light squeeze. Lilu just said he's fine. She called like a minute ago when you were passed out. Sam had a million questions about what had happened down there, but she swallowed them down one by one. How is he? How am I going to look at him ever again? I have to apologize. Zoe was already hyperventilating. You're not going anywhere until you calm down. I have to see him, Sam. She jumped off the bed and stormed out the door despite their cries. His door was literally four steps away from hers, so she paced barefoot yet determined, pressing the handle on his door without blinking. Behind her, Emma and Sam popped their heads through the door, conflicted between giving Zoe some room and making sure she was able to hold herself up. The tempest driving her turned still as she saw him lying bare-chested in his bed, only half awake. She stopped short. Zoe was unprepared. No imagined scenario. No previously rehearsed apology. Nothing but the lump in her throat and panting in her chest as she heard the door slamming shut behind. His room was smaller than hers, with dark wood flooring and matching headboard and nightstands engraved with gold accents. Only the cream bedding and arched windows broke the solemnity of the space. Zoe? His voice came faint yet surprised. Her fingers had inherently curled into shaking fists. Jasper, what have I done? Although his forearms and hands were back to normal, Zoe couldn't unsee the damage she'd done downstairs. He pulled himself slightly up. Guess you weren't joking when you said you looked for your ex in me, huh? That's not funny. I never said it was, but the corners of his mouth begged to differ. It was hard not to be struck by the symmetry of his features. The way his lips parted in a mischievous grin, the graceful manner in which his chest moved with his breaths, and how he held himself. He looked different with his hair now brushing his shoulders in blonde waves. Zoe's face turned crimson. I... She held her breath and spoke as if breathing alone could harm him. I never meant to hurt you. Her toes grazed the edge of the shaggy rug extending from under his bed. A good distance. A safe distance. Are you afraid to come near me? Yes. There was truth behind her sheepish answer. Don't be. What you've done is amazing. You shouldn't be afraid of your skills. You just have to wield them. Come here, he patted on the empty side of the bed, and she felt her heart still. Your hamster face is not gone, by the way. Getting too close was not an option not after nearly killing him. Legs up!
Come on! The least you can do is lay here next to your victim and make pleasant conversation. How could he find it in him to joke about this? You don't even like to talk. I like to hear you talk. Yeah, well, I'm not good at monologues, she countered. Look, first you kiss me. Then you tell me it was a mistake. Then I nearly fry you, and it hasn't even been 24 hours. I think being next to each other might be a bad idea. You came to my room, remember? Another smirk followed. There's no winning with you. There's no losing either. He did love a challenge. Zoe gave in, her legs landing in a flat noise beside his. Now what? She crossed her arms over her chest in protest. Technically, things went haywire when she touched him, so there'd be no more of that as far as she was concerned. There was no denying Jasper enjoyed getting his way. Now you'll tell me about your upbringing. In detail, he demanded under her scrutinizing gaze, it was uncanny how fast he disarmed her. She stared back and gave an exasperated sigh. I was born and raised in the North and moved up here when I was 12 with my moms because people were supposed to be more open to same-sex families in big cities, and I was getting bullied at school. Uncle Frank lives here too, so it seemed like a good move. Bullied? Yeah. When kids are being mean to you because you're different. A timeless practice in all schools on earth. Sometimes because you're physically different than most. Sometimes because you have different preferences. And sometimes because you have two moms or two dads or even a single parent. We fight against it every day at St. Andrews. Sometimes we win and sometimes our efforts are not enough to stop the bullies. Jasper's brow creased, trying to put the pieces together. I suppose 11 billion years eradicated that on opt, right? Your frontal cortex reaches maturity at the age of 25. Ours around the age of 9, so kids under that age can perform the bullying you spoke of. I told you we were similar yet slightly different. For Optins, there's a direct connection between the prefrontal cortex and brainstem that inhibits acting out our instincts if our brain perceives them as wrong. Humans share the same brain structure, only it takes slightly longer to mature. Take jealousy, for example. Unheard of for Optins. Our brain structure is too evolved for that, he winked. As if, she rolled her eyes mockingly and watched him grin back. As if what? I wouldn't call you emotionally mature. He did call her petulant after all. Because I didn't fall in love after our first kiss. Ha! Huh, you came to my room, remember? Touché again. Optins might love with logic, but sadly, the limbic system remains unaltered. There was something different in his look now, something she couldn't quite identify. The limbic system controls feelings and emotions in both Optins and humans, and it's not inhibited by judgment in the slightest. So, an Optin can love, but would never act out on jealousy or punch someone in the face because of our natural inhibitors. That's what I meant. Zoe nodded in surprise. I'd say that's very civilized. Go on. Back to the upbringing. Jasper steadied an arm behind his head and looked at Zoe, who was fiddling with the laces on her hoodie. When I tell people I grew up with two moms, they're always curious to know what that's like. Like they're expecting me to make a parallel between growing up in a household with a mom and dad versus two moms. I can't do that. My biological dad came from a sperm bank. She shrugged. But I can tell you, I have the best moms in the universe. They taught me everything I know, so contrary to common stereotypes, I can bake and take the garbage out. She lifted an empowered chin. He chuckled softly as she continued. They're both quite competitive and challenge each other all the time. 
you'd love to see Christmas dinner at their place. They turned everything into a competition, although neither of them was a sour loser and Jasper was all too willing to listen to all the human tales. By the time she relaxed next to him, they were facing each other, hands propped to their temples on soft sheets. Well, I told you about my parents. Do you ever leave Earth to spend some time with yours? In human terms, I get to see them three times a year. That's not a lot. They knew what they were signing me up for when they chose my enhancements, and none of us regret it. It was nice to see this relaxed version of him, smiling with all his teeth. How long will you stay on Earth? That's up to the Alliance. They like to move us around the planets we monitor so we can experience all sorts of atmospheres and habitats. I'm at the beginning of my profession. Earth is my first planet, Etienne's mission here, on the other hand, lasted over nine years. And the rest of you? Gerard and Aline have been here longer than any of us, and they've already worked on ten other planets before their romantic partnership. Since they're a couple now, the Alliance always sends them on missions together, and they track on land. Lilu's an interesting mix. She's an on-and-off-land soldier, and Alex is office-based only. As in, Lilu gets to work in outer space as well. You catch up fast. So, do all intelligent life forms look like us? Quite a few of them do, thanks to Pan's Permia. Jasper watched Zoe cock her head and narrow her eyes a little. She hesitated, the way you would if you weren't really sure if you'd like the truth. Humans are intelligent enough to predict most outcomes without necessarily having the right tools for it. Panspermia is an Earth-given name to a theory you'll be able to demonstrate soon enough. You know where we come from, don't you? Why we're here as a species. The realization of it alone covered her arms in goosebumps. Jasper reached for his intersat and tapped until he projected a text for Zoe to see. She began reading with slight tremor. In 1743, the theory of Pan's Permia appeared in the writings of French nobleman, diplomat, and natural historian Benoit de Melee, who believed that that life on Earth was seeded by germs from space falling into the oceans rather than life arising through abiogenesis. In a virtual presentation on Tuesday, April 7, 2009, Stephen Hawking discussed why alien life might not be contacting the human race during his conclusion of the Origins Symposium at Arizona State University Hawking also talked about the possibility of alien life through the theory of panspermia, which says that life in the form of DNA particles can be transmitted through space to habitable places. A reaction report from NASA Ames doubted that living cells could be found at such high altitudes, but noted that some microbes can remain dormant for millions of years, possibly long enough for an interplanetary voyage within a solar system. Jasper registered Zoe, clenching her fingers to her chest, baffled. See? You've kind of known it since 1743? She stapled a hand to her mouth. So that's what we are? Traveling bacteria in search of a proper environment to develop? The differences in evolution and development depend entirely on the environment. We look alike because our conditions were similar. You might have noticed our eyes are different. He wasn't wrong. Not only did his eyes look like liquid gold in Zoe's view, but his face also belonged on a canvas. Optins were their own kind of beautiful and their own kind of peculiar too. And you don't seem to have any pores or freckles or body hair. For one with one too many freckles, their skin stood out like nothing else. You notice that, huh? I wonder how many optins you had to undress to figure that one out. His wits, though, hadn't managed to foresee the cushion coming for his face. Alex found humans difficult, unpredictable. 
their approach to resolution very different from the discipline instilled in Optins. He found Mia, however, easier to work with. She didn't ask too many questions and executed orders much like the soldiers he came in contact with sporadically. He missed the quiet time working behind the curtain, the infinite satisfaction of calculating angles and assessing Optins who never questioned his commands. This had been by far a most intricate mission. What weakens your portaling skills? Mia asked, dipping her toes further in the sand. She had portaled them to Evia, the second largest island in Greece, according to Alex. All she had to do was memorize the coordinates, which dropped them on the beach. He'd allowed her to remove her shoes and take it all in before moving on. I don't think there's a limit when it comes to how many times you can portal yourself. Portaling many people with you can be a challenge. You need to expand the magnetic field to include the others, and that takes more energy and practice. They were sitting side by side in the sand, resting their arms on their knees like two friends catching up over a breathtaking view. Despite the strong wind bruising her ears, February didn't seem as bad in Greece. I collapsed when I had to portal seven people twice in less than 40 minutes. That's what Kalinium's for. It helps you channel your energy, sharpen your senses. You have enough of it to keep you going. Optins with high portaling enhancements usually work in relocation. My portaling skills are developed enough to portal around 40 people at a time. He smiled softly. That's nothing by comparison. Mia cocked her head his way. Relocation. If a home planet within the Alliance is endangered by, let's say, cosmic factors, a burst in another galaxy, the explosion of their sun, among others, the relocation team comes in. Now we can only portal freely here on Earth. For interplanetary portaling, there would have to be someone on the other side, opening a portal for us to step through. If I tried to portal back to Opt, I'd need someone over there to open a portal for me, or I'd probably end up somewhere in between, and dead, for sure. When they relocate others, the team is split in two, half on the home planet and half on the host planet, so the habitants can go through. So much for all the sci-fi movies she'd watched. So the myth has fallen. No flying spaceships, then? Alex pursed his lips and smiled, still staring at the exact line where the sky met the sea. Battleships, yes. The Alliance has quite the fleet. Despite the long sleeves on her hoodie, Alex couldn't help but notice the tattooed dove's wing stretching out to her knuckles. He didn't understand tattoos. Too tribal for his taste and too out of tune with Mia, like they didn't belong on her. Neither did that scar, extending from her neck to the curve of her jaw. He sighed, imagining her past, that perfect ivory skin now permanently scarred, those blue eyes carrying a constant sadness. He'd wanted to ask about her scars, but refrained himself. Machines could be fixed. Mia no longer could. Keeping a portal open for so long must be draining. Mia stared at her sandy toes, contemplating. What if I could indeed travel between planets without help? Every enhancement Etienne's given us defies the Alliance. It would make perfect sense, wouldn't it? Took you a while to figure it out. Alex turned to face her apprehensive stare. Things were easier in June than in February. We knew it immediately after we met Rufus. Etienne has given you enhancements that are unethical, immoral, and completely prohibited within the Alliance. It all dawned on her. Because their enhancements crossed the line of morality, Rufus and herself could violate interplanetary laws. It made her heart pound at an alarming pace. It meant trespassing planets, taking over the minds and bodies of other beings. The pounding reached her temples, 
and she felt her hands shaking. Mia locked eyes with Alex before stating the obvious. Beck doesn't want our enhancements for himself. He's creating an army of altered soldiers. Shit! And you've taken us in to make sure we don't follow in his footsteps. Heat rose from her stomach to her head as she turned to him. Why didn't you kill us and get it over with? Something inside her just broke. Alex locked fingers around his knees and met her death stare. We're here to assist planets, not kill. There's been enough murder on our shoulders. In a perfect world, we'd come up with a solution to strip you of these enhancements and make you forget this ever happened before it escalates. We can't do that yet. We've sent all your blood samples to the lab, and we now have over 30 scientists working on your case on OPT. Mia got to her feet and wrapped her arms around herself, her lips nearly purple from the gutting February wind. She swallowed hard. What can Zoe do? She took a step toward the sea, watching the gulls distantly diving in for the kill. My thoughts have been confirmed. She can harness energy. Lilu sent an update twenty minutes ago. She turned to him, confused, as the wind blew some strands of her messy buns sideways. What does that mean, exactly? Alex used his breath to warm his fingers as he spoke. It means she can manipulate energy. In an estimated guess, probably even gamma rays. Now imagine someone directing gamma rays at planets with intelligent life, and someone who could take her close enough to do it. Mia brushed the hair off her face in shock. She's a human weapon. The realization of it stung. Now my guess is Beck wants some sort of a deal. Hence, Rufus, the other boy, and yourself. Otherwise, he'd use Zoe as a killing machine eventually. I'm only speculating, but she was able not only to harness energy, but to replicate it in her first attempt. Imagine what that could do on a larger scale and with the proper training. What Beck wants is power. Over everyone. He doesn't want to join your alliance or get a step higher on that stupid scale. He wants to control everything. The sand was brazenly hitting their faces, and they were no longer able to fight the cold. Beck needed them enough to keep Rufus alive. It was all she needed to know. Alex got up and brushed the sand off. Let's get back to June, shall we? Wait. Don't you at least want to see if your theories are right? If I could portal to some forsaken planet by myself. The wind blew mercilessly, covering their hair in sand and making them both rub their eyes. Come on. This time around, I have to show you how to portal to a time loop. He pulled the intersat from his pocket and displayed the coordinates. Mia scanned the beach like Beck had taught her. Public places are not a stage for performance. She remembered him saying, despite the wind and a weird, distant barking noise, there was no one in sight. For the fourth time today, Alex bent to open a portal, only this time he touched sand and did not hate the feeling. He tapped twice on his Kalinium watch and whispered in position, both Alex and Mia landed as graceful as cats in the ballroom, undisturbed by the fall. What if I could portal Beck somewhere far and leave him there? Don't you want to see if it works? Mia pushed. It works, Alex saw her jaw dropping. That was not Evia, was it? Mia scowled, her whole body caught in a new shiver. Alex crinkled his nose as he replied and raised his brows defensively. Nope. That was Planet Steb. He shrugged, somehow expecting a left jab and possibly a right cross coming violently at his face. Instead, she stood there, analyzing his grimaces and trying to figure out if he still had sand in his eyes or if interplanetary travel had in fact messed with his screws. Um, 
What's wrong with your face? Mia turned to him. Aren't you supposed to slap me or something? His question only made her angrier. Were humans regarded like some sort of an inferior species, prone to uncontrollable violence? Okay, now it makes perfect sense. Why you're behind the scenes? And Lee Lu's out there kicking ass? Is that why you said in position? Were you awaiting access? He scanned her, still wary. Are you not upset? I didn't tell you? I'm guessing you're smart enough not to go on a suicide mission. And you probably didn't want me to get nervous. That doesn't mean I'm okay with lies. All cards on the table, remember? Alex nodded. Now let's go brag to everyone about what you can do. Sam was getting impatient. She's been gone for over 30 minutes. She glanced back at Emma, who seemed lost in thought. What? Sam tapped her foot viciously. It was hard not to feel overprotective considering what Zoe had been going through. I'd worry more about what Zoe can do to Jasper than what Jasper can do to Zoe. Emma turned to her friend. She's not as fragile as you think. She took a seat beside her on the silky white duvet and took Sam's hand in hers. What I'm saying is that I think she needs to make her own choices and learn from them. Sam couldn't believe her ears. We found her crying and unable to articulate a sentence. She passed out as we were carrying her upstairs, and no Optin came to check in on her. She nearly killed that poor bastard downstairs, and you're telling me she's in a state where she can make her own choices? Yes. She walked like a frigging zombie when she went to check on Jasper, and we literally have no clue as to what she's capable of. Now that Zoe's powers had been unleashed, Sam couldn't help but cringe at the thought. She bolted up in an anxious move. I'm going to get her. The anxiety building in her chest pushed her out of the room like an avalanche, despite Emma's pleas.